Heroes in academia? Yes, they exist. One of them, Jay Bhattacharya, joins us now to talk about your internet and your speech and the government that's trying to take it all away. I'm James Polis. Welcome to Zero Hour. Jay Bhattacharya is a med school professor at Stanford University. His previous research focused on the epidemiology of COVID-19 and the policy responses to the epidemic. He's now embroiled in high stakes litigation. Jay, how are you? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me, James. All right. So let's start with this case. Uh, it began as Missouri v. Biden. You were a plaintiff. This had to do with uh, government actions pertaining to speech on the internet, initially about COVID and then some other stuff. It's now called uh, Murphy v. Missouri as it's made its way all the way up to uh, the Supreme. Supreme Court just heard uh, some oral arguments on the case. Where do things stand? What's your involvement? And what are you expecting at this point? So I'm a plaintiff in the case. Basically what we found in the lower courts and the lower courts affirmed is that the Biden administration has set up a censorship complex. They basically went to social media companies said, you must censor these people and these ideas, including the kinds of ideas I was talking about during the pandemic, you know, sensible ones like, you know, really crazy ones, actually, like you should keep schools open. That, 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 was, that was a particular focus. The vaccine doesn't stop you from getting and spreading COVID. Th those were all ideas you weren't allowed to say. At the time. At the time. Uh, and what we found is that the, the White House, the CDC, the Surgeon General's office, the FBI, uh, they had back doors into the social media companies telling them you must censor these people and these ideas with it implied or else. Uh, a lower court judge actually said that it's like Al Capone threatening, uh, threatening a Chicago business. You know, it's a nice business you have there. It'd be a shame if something were to happen to it. Okay, so if that if that were it, if that were the extent of it, it would be an outrage. Seems patently unconstitutional. Uh, uh, Judge Jackson, in in the 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 uh, oral argument, uh, was actually talking about how the First Amendment was a hamstringing the government. <laughs> Uh, did you listen to that quote? I mean, it's really scandalous. What do you make of it? Uh, so I was there at the oral argument. It was absolutely, I was on the floor uh, because, you know, the, the, <laughs> maybe I'm wrong. I mean, I'm an immigrant to this country, so maybe I'm wrong. James, you can correct me. But it said, the first amendment says Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. I mean, that's how it starts. Pretty straightforward stuff. Isn't it supposed to hamstring what the government can do? I mean, I mean it just says the, the government can't violate a fundamental human civil right, right? Yeah, so, you know, these are inalienable rights. They can, actually can't be taken away. They can only be uh, abused. So talk a little bit about the shot selection here. Uh, government picked uh, certain people, uh, certain institutions to muzzle uh, around COVID and some other stuff. Uh, why did they pick who they picked? Well, uh, I mean, I can just speak from my perspective. I, I wrote the Great Barrington Declaration, which is a document in October 2020. I wrote with a, a Harvard professor, Martin Kulderf, and, uh, and, and Sunetra Gupta, an Oxford professor. We argued that lift lockdowns and focus protection of vulnerable people. Four days after we wrote it, Francis Collins, the head of the NIH, wrote to Tony Fauci, ordering a devastating takedown. Uh, of of us uh, of the of the idea, and then called me a fringe epidemiologist, uh, even though I've been a professor for you know a few decades. Um, I mean, I think what they wanted was they wanted to suppress any knowledge in the American people that there was actually scientific opposition to their harebrained ideas. Yeah, I want to talk a little bit more about the Brits in in a minute, but you know, it seems like the standard that's being pushed for here. We'll see if they can actually pull it off. I hope they can't. Is that you can't say it on the internet unless the government says you can say it or unless the government says it first. I mean, that's exactly the standard they, they put forward. In, in the oral arguments, the, the Biden administration lawyer actually said that, there, that it was such a difficult time and there really ought to be a vaccine exemption to the First Amendment. I, I mean, I was, I, was on the, I, was, I was just floored by this. I mean, I think the idea that uh, at a, uh, dur during an emergency, uh, we, sh we don't need the First Amendment, that we ought to be able to, to just trust, to have the government just trust what, we, what should be and shouldn't be said is absolutely insane. It's especially during an emergency, we need the First Amendment. It's when, if the government gets something wrong, you need to have outside voices being able to be heard saying, look, the government's getting this wrong. Otherwise, the government's gonna keep doing wrong things, as they did during the pandemic. And some of these claims that you were out there with, major statements about what happens to you or doesn't happen to you based on the, the efficacy of the vaccine, those things were then admitted later by the government 
It's the same statements, the same claims. <laughs> I mean, it's uh, it's shocking. I mean, if you look through the history of the pandemic, it's it's hard to find things that government got right, right? What is the uh, what's the risk of dying if you get COVID? They got that wrong. Uh, what is the risk of like are we all equally at risk, or are older people high, much higher risk than younger people? They got that wrong. Does the vaccine stop you from getting and spreading COVID? They got that wrong. That does, does immunity after COVID recovery actually provide immunity? They got that wrong. On item after item, uh, are school closures damaging and necessary uh, and unnecessary? They got that wrong. I mean, on item after item, they got it wrong. It was, and they, as a result, there are people that are dead today that should have, should be alive, and people whose businesses were closed, children who are depressed, who are, who have lost learning. Uh, it was tremendously damaging, and the government censored outside critics in order to keep their error going. And these officials still pretend that they don't understand why there are so many conspiracy theories around the vaccine <laughs> issue. I mean, uh, the, the, uh, the, the whole idea that, there are, that uh, government critics are necessarily conspiracy theorists, that's essentially the idea that they have in mind when they want to suppress the First Amendment. They want to say that what, only what the government believes is in the Overton window, and what the government is saying is within the Overton window, you know, what, what you're allowed to say, what, what people should be allowed to think. It's only by allowing outside voices, even sometimes if they're wrong, that actually, that actually leads to a healthier uh, scientific discussion, a healthier republic. Yeah. So, there, you know, there are a couple kinds of conspiracy theories, you know. Uh, one of them is, I, I'm bored, I like to have fun, I can talk about crazy theories, it's a fun way to pass the time. Uh, but there's a deeper reason for, for, for these things, and, and that has to do with trust. If you do not trust your government because your government has demonstrated to you plainly that at least on some major life and death issues, they simply can't be trusted and they don't care whether or not they can be trusted. You are going to have to rely on yourself and those around you to try to piece together some coherent understanding of where you stand in relationship to that government. So we saw this, I mean, we're, we're still seeing this now where the, every couple months we hear more rumors about a second pandemic or some other project that's gonna be sort of unleashed on the world over the next couple of years. Uh, how much credence do you give to these ideas that what happened with COVID was in some way uh, the opening phase of a larger project? Well, I think uh, I, I tend not to, I, I tend to be one of these people that doesn't, that, that don't see grand designs. What I see is uh, a crisis that happened uh, in, in part because of absolute bungling, which is the normal state of humanity, uh, and then people taking advantage of that crisis. You know, pharmaceutical companies taking advantage of that crisis, political actors taking advantage of that crisis, academics taking advantage of that crisis. That, to me, is is a sufficient story to explain what happened during the pandemic. But it, but I will say this about about what you said, James, is that is is that there's a now a template for how to respond to this, uh, to these kinds of crises that scares the living daylights out of me. That because it'll happen again. It absolutely will happen again. The the lockdowns will come, uh, at, until we get a, vac a, a barely tested vaccine. That is now the norm for dealing with pandemics. Uh, the the the, the uh, alliance, the close alliance between pharma and government, pharma and the media. That's that's the norm now. The the destruction of of free speech rights. That that unless the Supreme Court does something uh, right, is the norm now. Uh, and so that I think is to me is the bigger bigger problem. Um, you know, the, actually, one more thing about the conspiracy theories. The, the, uh, the government conflates conspiracy things that are legitimately really just not really that, that they're not likely to be true. You know, the, the vaccine has magnets or something in it uh, with people who are saying reasonable things like, look, uh, lots of countries that are betting, uh, getting heavily vaccinated, the disease is still spreading. The vaccine doesn't stop you from getting and spreading COVID. They conflate the two and they, and they suppress both as if both were equally sort of ep epistemically supported. Um, and they're not. Well, and we've seen that pattern spread through other hot button issues in the realm of pharma and health. I mean, it, trans kids, we are told that that is a thing. And if you don't acknowledge that that's a thing, then once again, there's something wrong with you. Your speech needs to be suppressed. You are per perpetrating acts of psychic violence on strangers of the internet. How big is this thing going to get before it starts rolling back? Well, I do think one, um, one really hopeful thing that's come out of the pandemic is there are a lot more skeptical people. Right, people don't automatically take the word of Tony Fauci anymore. Uh, people don't automatically take the word even of, of, of top medical authorities. Uh, and medical authorities don't like that, of course. We, we, want, to, we want to be obeyed or, or listened to just as if, we're, as if we were uh, you know, high popes of science. Uh, but I think it's actually healthy to have that kind of skepticism. I, once upon a time, people would say, well, look, if a doctor tells you something, go get a second opinion. That was just the norm. The idea that we ought to trust 
unquestioningly, people like Tony Fauci never made any sense. And uh, the, 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 the to me, the broadened uh, set of pe skeptics, if you will, in uh, the American public is actually quite a hopeful sign that maybe, maybe the future will be better. Especially in a, in a country and in a society that has become so incredibly risk averse. You would think that, you know, this is going beyond just listening to a doctor tell you something. This is beyond advice. This is, I am taking a substance and I'm putting it in your body and it's never coming out. You think you might want a second opinion. Yeah, well, I think the, I think the American people deserved a second opinion. I think there, there should never have been uh, pressure to take an, uh, essentially something that had just been tested for uh, two months uh, in, in, a, in a randomized trial. I mean, I, I, I personally, when I uh, would talk to people about the vaccine early on, I was quite aware of the, the fact that we had, we didn't, well, there was a lot we didn't know about it. It looked promising, and, but, it, but it looked promising for older people to me. It, and given the uncertainty, I recommended against young people taking it. The government censored that. Uh, I mean, I think in retrospect, that was, that was really right. Like it, you have uh, just a couple of, a few months after, uh, uh, you know, just a few months after the vaccine came out, we found out that it causes myocarditis in young men at unacceptably high rates. We should never have been told, telling young people to take it given the benefit that they gained from it was so little. They say that good men create good times. Well, the same's true of businesses. Good people are the bedrock of successful enterprises. But unfortunately, today, the hiring pool is bleak. Political demands, petty entitlement, open incompetence, they're all commonplace. You need to reach the people who are keen to join your business. New Founding has created a network of these high excellence professionals who are seeking to join grounded, pro-American businesses. These are individuals often in elite organizations who are ready to go for a team and a mission that supports their values instead of working against them. Aligned companies are using this network right now to hire high trust, exceptional individuals who match the culture and the mission of their teams. Join the New Founding Talent Network. Find your next hire. Apply for access to the New Founding Talent Network at newfounding.com backslash talent. You'll get connected with the candidates who will build up your business. That's newfounding.com backslash talent. Let's talk about the international angle. You mentioned uh, the NIH, National Institutes of Health. You mentioned, uh, you know, and there, there are critics in, in the UK too, as well as people who are really pushing this thing. How much of the way that the, the lockup of the internet, speech on the internet coming out of COVID, do you think um, came from outside the United States, whether it's Canada or the UK or elsewhere? No, I think that, that, that the governments of the West all played enormous role in suppressing the internet. Uh, the EU, uh, Ireland, the UK, Canada, Australia have all have these internet safety bills, uh, these these sort of online online essentially online censorship bills. And the excuse is always the same: it's too dangerous to let people hear what what's going on on the internet because there might be wrong things on the internet, uh, in effect, or or and, and the dangerous misinformation. And so it gives the government power to go to the internet companies legally and tell them you can't you can't say that you can't allow that to be said. Uh, that pressure has absolutely affected how what's what's allowed to be said in the U.S. as well. Yeah, I mean, this is what really bothers me is like, this is not our form of government. We have a constitutionally guaranteed form of government. And yeah, we've got allies, you know, across the Atlantic and some other places. And yes, we have some sort of longstanding cultural history with, with those countries, people in those countries. But they do not have the constitutional protections that we have. And they don't have the form of government that we have. And when they make these sweeping decisions about how to regulate technology, how to regulate speech, how to regulate people and machines, um, really as if they're just one thing that's subject to the same kind of regulation, that has tremendous implications for our regime. And if the people in charge of our regime are looking across the Atlantic and going like, yes, we need to do this, that has to come up to a vote. That has to be subject to the amendment process. And that's not what's happening. I mean, I completely agree with you. I mean, I was actually thinking uh, back to what happened during the Cold War. We effectively divorced ourselves from the, the the Soviet era, so the so, the Soviet bloc, we, the the intellectual trends in the Soviet bloc, we, we divorced ourselves from the legal kinds of ideas in the Soviet bloc. Right, they had very little role. We set up that Iron Curtain worked both ways, mm -hmm. um, and it protected us from draconian policies. Right, imagine if the the the, the Soviet ideas about how to manage uh, dissidents had seeped into American culture. That is essentially is what's happening now. You have to see this, I, I, it's a silicon curtain that's like descended across the West uh, w with the governments essentially taking on the role of, of censors. Uh, it, is, uh, it is absolutely frightening.
Well, and it's, it's very concerning to compare that to what we've got going on now with China, which is exactly the opposite of the dynamic you described. So, well, you know, unfortunately, we do have to pursue advanced bioweapons research because the Chinese are doing it. And if we let them get a nose out ahead, then the whole world's going to blow up. Or, well, I know, you know, social credit can seem scary, but, you know, the Chinese are really getting ahead of the curve. And, and so we need to keep up. Is this competition with China going to turn us into China? It, 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 I mean, in many ways, it, it's already, it already has. I mean, the lockdowns themselves, in, in March 2020, we undertook an absolutely extraordinary policy to lock down the country. We closed schools, we closed churches, we closed businesses. Uh, the, the World Health Organization, a month before, it issued a report saying that, that the Chinese lockdown of January 2020 had worked. That played a pivotal role in Western governments adopting essentially a Chinese policy uh, kind of uh, approach to pandemics that had never been adopted in the West before. And it was a, a, an utter disaster. That The influence of these kind of Chinese policies, these draconian Chinese policies, authoritarian Chinese policies on American, American policies, really, it's, it's, it's already there. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm dating myself now, old enough to remember when, uh, when Tom Friedman had that column in the New York Times where he was just, oh, man, if only we could be China for a day, you know, they can just sort of wave their hands and make all the bad stuff go away. And now these same people, I mean, not Friedman explicitly, although maybe he said it, I stopped reading him a long time ago, the same type of person takes a look at Donald Trump and they say, this guy is a maniac. He wants to be a dictator because he wants to be able to like efficiently solve problems instead of relying on our sacred democracy. Isn't it insane how fast that script, script has flipped? It's almost as if, I don't know, I, I look at what's going on with the court case. I look at what's going on with these, these bizarre and, and deeply anti-American defenses of censorship being rolled out. And I think, do they really believe it? Or are they just kind of trying to hang on? I mean, it's hard for me to take it seriously, but I heard, I was sitting in the Supreme Court chambers, the oral arguments, and you had sitting members of the Supreme Court who apparently do not s seem to understand the most basic s fact about American civics, right? Like that, what, what is the First Amendment for? To protect Americans from government overreaching and preventing us from speaking to each other. I hope at least that that, that was just uh, some hypothetical that uh, the, the Supreme Court justices were batting around and not something they actually believe. But it sure didn't seem that way to me when I was when I was sitting there in, in the court. Um, I, I don't I don't really understand how whether what the Americans actually can would ever want to embrace this kind of authoritarian power. I just it's it just seems foreign to me, and and I don't I keep hoping that people will wake up to that. Well, in in some literal respects, it is foreign, right? It is coming from from the old world, and I think you know I think the old world has had a tough shake, and some of those some of those challenges are very hard to resolve. You come out of the you know this is I'm I'm going to do a, a Vladimir Putin and detour into a long historical excursus, uh, but I'll try to condense it. Um, Look, you had the Reformation, you had the wars of Reformation, and a lot of that stuff never really got resolved. Uh, and there's still this kind of tug of war over what is, what is the spiritual authority that is going to ground our treatment of the law, of understanding what the law is and what its scope is. Uh, you know, America's very blessed. We, we had a different set of problems, and we, we still have a different set of problems. And in some ways, you know, it is more difficult for us because we do have these constitutional safeguards. We can't just snap our fingers and, you know, and, and bring the hammer down anytime we see a problem. Um, but, you know, in, in the U.S., you know, the founders had this big country full of, you know, uh, people who were capable of exercising self-government. Uh, and so it, it wasn't this kind of thing where it's like, well, you know, this isn't the ideal regime, but we kind of do need to start here because the conditions are, are pretty bad and we, we might have to, like, you know, just kind of whip people into shape before they can be trusted with basic self-government, with natural rights. Uh, that wasn't the situation, but it seems like, you know, it seems like all too many people today right here in America without taking foreign influence into account look around and they say people are just too stupid. They're just too hateful. They're just too angry. And we need to treat them like like bad children. And we I mean, need to take away their rights. There have never been bad people before in the history of mankind right. that, any, that any government has had to deal with. I mean, that's just never, that never is the case. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's shockingly naive, right? Because if you allow the government to have those kinds of authoritarian powers, they're not going to use it for good. They didn't use it for good during the pandemic. They, they, and they're not going to use it for good. They don't, they don't, there's no, uh, there's no uh, high pope of science that can inerringly distinguish between true and false, and then squash the false. Uh, the the uh, you bring up the Reformation. One of the one of the uh, the, uh, the, the the events of uh, around that time, you know, was the was the Enlightenment. The the invention of the Gutenberg press led to a crisis. All of a sudden, 
the, the high authorities, both ecclesiastical and, and, uh, and, and governmental authorities, faced a threat. People could write and publish books that very many people could read very, cheap, very cheaply they could publish these books. And it was a crisis. They couldn't, they, and they put in place a censorship regime that ensnared Galileo. Uh, what we are facing now, and now essentially, it, uh, is a second threat to the Enlightenment. We have a technology in the form of the internet that allows anybody to speak to almost everybody. And it threatens scientific powers and it threatens governmental powers. The, what, we, what we learned from the process of the Enlightenment was that free speech was an essential component of scientific discourse, of science. If you don't have free speech, you don't have science. You have to allow the Galileos of the world to disagree with the, 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 the powers that be, present their evidence and see what happens. And that's how science works. That's how science actually advances, by allowing people to be disagree with other scientists, with, with, with authorities that believe ideas that turn out to be false. In the form of the internet, we now have a, way, a, a capacity for regular people, regular citizens. I mean, I, there are tons of things I've learned by being on the internet from people that don't have credentials, and yet they're saying, they're presenting data, they're, they're, they're presenting you know, ideas that the academics are afraid to say. It's a big threat uh, to authority, but also a huge potential, enormous gain for civilization if we only can embrace it. Yeah, the best lesson of the Enlightenment is that science can't be a religion. Not because religion is bad, but because, you know, science, you, you have to have that, those disputes and you have to be able to work through them uh, in a controlled way. Um, it is, you know, I mean, Barack Obama, right before the, the past uh, presidential election, goes out there and he tells Vox, you know, basically the Internet is the biggest threat to, uh, to democracy in America. I mean, he, he's exactly backwards. Right. I mean, it, it's a it's maybe the biggest threat to, to the kinds of political power or the, the people he wants in political power. It may be the biggest threat to uh, or, orthodoxies such as uh, the ones embraced by Tony Fauci. But it's not the biggest threat to democracy. It's not the biggest threat to science, it's the biggest promise for both of those things. It, I, there's and there's no there's no real uh, philosophical reason you can really uh, embrace to say, look, uh, we should empower these sets of people to silence these other sets of people. It makes no sense. It, it, the, 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 the people that want control of the internet, the, and in this case, let's just be very specific, you know, the people like, uh, uh, like the, the, the Surgeon General of the United States, the, the, the President of the United States, um, the, the head of the CDC, the, 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 the FBI. Bill right? Gates? Uh, Bill Gates, absolutely. There's some irony there, but yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, so you, you, these these people, they don't possess all the knowledge and wisdom of the world such that they, they, they are always right. And they sometimes are catastrophically wrong and they have tremendous power. And it's, if, it's only really the ability for people to make reasoned arguments that can be heard that, that constrains their power. I mean, if they, if they are wrong, if, you know, if, if I was wrong about school closures, I mean, I would say it because I would I'd look, look back and see, you know, I, I said school closure is not going to help stop the spread, yet there are these countries that close schools and they have zero COVID. I would have said I was wrong. We could have had an argument, uh, but, but so, and, and my reputation would have been hurt by that. Instead, what happened was you had powerful people saying we had to close schools or else. And they're wrong. You see, you see Sweden doesn't close schools. They have the lowest all-cause excess deaths in, in all of, of basically the whole world. Uh, they, they, their kids have no learning loss. I mean, if there had been a real argument, I mean, by the way, we knew this in 2020, that, 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 that the school closures were not, I mean, the, the scientific evidence was in. That's why, that's, I mean, that's why I felt confident arguing it. If we had had a free, open discussion, our kids would be better off. Remember when business used to be about making money, taking care of your customers, and providing for your family? What happened? Wokeness, DEI, ESG. They've conquered America's best companies, but the spirit of the American entrepreneur is still free. Now more than ever, the best founders in America are walking away from corrupt big corporations and blazing their own trail. New founding is rallying these founders who just want to get back to that original American idea of building inspiring, disruptive companies, the very best in the world. New founding is investing in these companies through their venture fund. The companies they invest in are defined by a simple question, does the country we want to live in need this company that this person is building? 
you can join them. Venture investing isn't for everyone, but if you're a serious, accredited investor who wants to see a more hopeful future for this country, go to newfounding.com backslash venture fund and apply to be an investor. Again, that's newfounding.com backslash venture fund. Join their venture fund today. Let's talk about the universities for a second. Uh, started out as uh, ostensibly great institutions, beacons of, of learning and, and knowledge and uh, the free exchange of ideas. Uh, now they strike a lot of Americans as the bad guys. What happened? <laughs> I mean, I, I think uh, I, I have to say I have a mixed, mixed feelings about the university. So I, I work at a university. I, I, I'm devoted to the idea of the Stanford University where I work. Its motto is let the winds of freedom blow. If it lived up to that, it'd be an amazing thing. Right? I, I believe in the mission of research. I believe in the mission of teaching. Um, I, I believe that those, those are fundamentally important uh, uh, kinds of contributions to our civilization. Uh, and universities for the longest time have served that purpose. Uh, what's happened, I think, to the universities is that uh, it's become, um, they become uh, political playgrounds where, where political fads uh, I mean, it's not that there's nothing wrong with political fads per se. You can have you can have a fad, and you can have a counter fad, and you can have just people arguing with each other. That's that's fine. I don't have any problem with that. What's what's happened is that one particular political fad, the idea that uh, that universities can re-engineer society to make them more equal, to address a particular kind of injustice, you know, injust uh, injustices faced by by black people in the United States. Um, which, are, which are very, very real, but somehow the universities can, can be engineered around just simply the redress of that one grievance as opposed to the, the pluralistic set of aims that universities have had historically. That, I think, is the fundamental problem. Yeah, I mean, it seems to me that this is part of a, a broader undertaking to just simply establish a religion in the United States. I, I mean, the, it, if on every single hiring committee there is a DEI officer, which there, there is for the last decade or more at, at Stanford University, um, who will, will like who will sit in, in essentially silent judgment over your deliberations over whether somebody knows how to do math or right? Um, I mean, that's that's not that's what is that? I mean, that's like I, like you know. I think back to this again. The Soviet Union, they would have political officers in every single university hiring decision. Are they sufficient? Are the are the candidates sufficiently uh, in line with Communist Party orthodoxy? I mean, I, th I suspect something similar like that happens in in China. Um, the the nature of the orthodoxy itself is not so important as the fact that there is an, an orthodoxy that's being enforced in every hiring decision, whether it's related, had it anything to do with that orthodoxy or not. Just the fact that we have to, many, many people, university professors have to fill out DEI statements, essentially statements of faith, allegiance to a, to a certain you know, orthodoxy is, is just, I mean, I couldn't have imagined the university's 10 years ago requiring this, and yet now it's very, it's commonplace. Yeah, as, as an Orthodox Christian, it always pains me to hear people like Anthony Fauci described as Orthodox, and like these DI people as Orthodox. I mean, James, uh, I'm, I'm also Christian. I don't, I don't have, I don't have, I, I, think, I, I think that it is, uh, it, it is absolutely essential for people of faith to understand that, uh, that, that this kind of like pluralism is good for us, right? Uh, we're not, we're not, we have, I think we have good arguments. What's happened to, to Christians is that we get pushed aside as, as outside in, within university settings as if we're not, we're not reasonable people. Like yeah. We are also victims of this same orthodoxy. And you're not supposed to convert people by the sword, you know? You're not supposed to say like, okay, you know, you, you have to sign on the dotted line here or else, uh, or else you're gonna be persecuted. Um, that, that, that ain't right. Uh, but so a lot of Americans feel sort of stuck with the universities. Uh, you know, there's some lawsuits. You got Chris Rufo out there. He was on the show, sort of walked us through what he's doing with with uh, fight, fighting back against DEI. But you know, kids are still kids are going to go to college. A lot of parents feel like they got to send their kids to college. Um, you got the 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 Teal Fellowship out there uh, just released a new batch of fellows. Um, and you know, this just takes us right back to the Reformation. The 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 line from from Peter from uh, from Peter Teal that that kicked off the the press release was. Um, uh, the modern, this is a paraphrase, the modern university is as corrupt 
as the medieval Catholic Church, uh, but the Reformation is here. And, uh, you know, I'm sitting here thinking like, uh, you mean 200 years of, of uh, religious warfare and civil war and, and slaughter? Um, I, you know, I, I understand the, the yearning for, um, for spiritual and intellectual reform in the universities. Uh, but then you look across the Atlantic and you look through history and you go, you know, it usually isn't just a matter of like, taking someone all the way to the Supreme Court and you have that aha moment and then everything's nice again. Are we headed toward a prolonged period of deep-seated, spiritually-fueled civic unrest in this country? I mean, I think we're already in the middle of it, James, as you, I'm sure you, you know, I mean, I know you know. Um, I think the, uh, the, the problem, and you said spiritual, I think that really is the center of it. Like there's, the, there's a, a, a big fight uh, among Americans, big angst among Americans, and more broadly in the in the world about, you know, what is, what is a what is our purpose? Um, I think universities could play this role, but I, I, I in, in a sense I agree with Peter, uh, not necessarily about his Teal Fellowship, but just as a as a broad matter. If the universities don't serve that role, uh, I think other institutions will serve that role, and the development of those other institutions is incredibly healthy. I mean, I think. We think about the university systems, the Harvards, the Stanfords, as if they were monolithic entities that will never go away, that they're eternal. But there's no human institution that's eternal in that way. Like everything, everything that, that ultimately no longer serves the purpose of furthering our, our, uh, our, 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 our real purpose here on Earth ultimately is going to wither away, I think. Um, and, and I think competition from other entities, you know, Heterox Academy might be one, uh, this, this whole studio, this, this Blaze, Blaze um, uh, network, the, the, uh, the, 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 these are all institutions that are developing because of the failure of the central institutions. Uh, I do still believe in America, James. I think that we have the capacity to develop those parallel institutions and challenge central orthodoxy. That's the American story from, the, from its founding. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right about that. But, you know, and this is something that I, I think is underrated, uh, not, not discussed often enough in the, in the free speech discourse, the, the speech about speech. Yeah, obviously it's very important. And, you know, you've got, uh, you got heterodox going, you've got a, a scene in, in Austin, and Elon Musk is out there, and obviously what he's done for free speech on, uh, on Twitter slash X is real. Uh, it was a real transformation. And um, having, you know, having, having that as part of the, the daily life of a lot of people who sort of spend their time talking on the internet, it has made a significant change. But free speech in isolation is not enough. You need free association. And that's part of the First Amendment too. Now, yeah, you have civil rights law and this sort of tinkered with that. But we're starting, I think, to realize that if free association is taken away, free speech can become toothless. How do we get back to free association, uh, especially you know on campus where that's becoming? You got segregated graduations now. Uh, that in some ways that's that's free association, but in other ways you know it's coming from a regime that really says certain groups of people cannot hang out together to the exclusion of others. It's all got to be inclusive, and we're going to police and punish that. I mean, isn't that ironic? Like the, the most puritanical people I've ever met in my life are not religious. Yeah. I mean, they're 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 uh, you know they're. They have a, a, a certain ideology of, of of sex that's completely divorced from religion. Yet they're and they're they're puritanical in their behavior. Uh, the most, uh, I mean, among the most racist people I've met in my life, are claim claim themselves to be anti-racist. They they embrace the idea that uh, there should be s s effective segregation between between. Uh, between peoples, that one group is so irredeemably bad that they're that, that it's hopeless. Like there's no there's there's it's it's uh, it's the, the the only prescription they give is uh, is is sort of the, wear the hair shirt and, and 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 beat yourself as a way to like cleanse yourself of your whiteness. I mean, I think that is striking, right? Is it's it's a, it's, a, it's it is a kind of sin without any grace. Um, it's a, it's an alternate form of of a, of a, a religion. It's a, it's a Christian heresy, James. Is exactly yeah. what it is. Yeah, and you know what's crazy is uh, people are so fixated on this that they've almost forgotten what the pandemic, what the lockdowns were really like. I mean, we saw this with Ron DeSantis' campaign. He sort of went out there swinging and said, you know, I didn't do this, and we got these great results. And people are like, let's not talk about that era. Like, we're just gonna we're gonna pretend that kind of didn't happen. Does that like is that weird to you? That's really really depressing. Uh, but you know, I can understand it, right? So at the beginning of the of the lockdowns, let's say March 2020, it, if you look at the polls, it was broadly popular. There, it's just a sad to say for me, but there was it's a fact they were broadly popular within the Democratic Party certainly, but also within the Republican Party they're broadly popular. 
I think um, a, lo a, lo uh, a lot of the world, and, and certainly a lot of the red states, a lot of people in red states started to wake up faster than the people in the blue states. But even in the blue states, you see people wake up. But no one wants to go back and say, gosh, we embraced authoritarian power that led to the damage to our kids, that, that, that hurt uh, our basic fundamental liberties. They don't want us to go back and say, well, we, we got that wrong. Yeah. Well, this is sort of a weird one for Trump, too. You know, he's, he's still sort of like, the vaccines are beautiful, we had the best people, saved a lot of lives. Uh, uh, I don't know. I, it's, it's like the issue that no one is really willing to, to have a true reckoning with. I mean, Trump is such a complicated character on this, right? I think he put those lockdowns in place in part because he didn't know how to assess the, the scientific evidence, and he had scientific experts like Tony Fauci and Deborah Burks. Uh, telling him you have to do it, or you're going to sit, or two million people would die in months. Yeah, um, that estimate was. In fact, I got to when I, I actually got to go visit him in the Oval Office in August of 2020, um, and that he asked me whether two million people would die, uh, that that he, whether his lockdown had saved two million people, and that was based on a projection that was like just just absolute nonsense. So I had, I had to sadly tell him no. But he, I mean, I think he was genuinely conflicted about the lockdowns. He's why he brought in Scott Atlas to advise him in in the summer of 2020. But he didn't have the moral courage to fire Tony Fauci at the time, which he should have done. Um, and it's it's tough. Like I've I've had the the opportunity to talk with him uh, at least one time, and then with with uh, with Governor DeSantis many times. And the difference couldn't be more stark. Like Governor DeSantis, he'd read scientific papers, my papers, and other people's papers. We discussed footnotes of papers. Um, he understood this, this the the scientific reason why, but also the moral reason why the lockdowns were bad. For President Trump, I think he understood the lockdowns were bad, but he couldn't, he didn't have the tools to really change course. Yeah, and I mean, there was also this kind of weird crossover moment when very early on, it was kind of your, your pseudonymous right winger on the internet who was saying, hey guys, you know, I think something really bad's going on in China. We, we might want to pay attention to this. And it was, no, you're, you are racist if you don't go down oh, to that gosh, wet I... market this, this weekend and, you know, buy the bat suit. <laughs> I remember that. Uh, there was a, a you know, Nancy Pelosi, there was a, uh, what is a Chinese New Year's parade in yeah. San Francisco. She go, goes out and hugs, hugs people in the parade to, as a show of, of solidarity. Um, I mean, the thing is, is like epidemiologically, if you have a disease that's already sort of infected a large city that's connected to the world via air travel, you have, you know, by J January, you had like outbreaks in Iran, in Italy, in, in, the, in the UK, everywhere, basically. It's already too late to lock down. So epidemiologically, Trump was wrong then. It was wrong to like close the, the it was already too late. The horse is out of the barn. Um, and, but then you had this switch where uh, lockdown was the wise thing to do in March of 2020. And Basically, almost everybody was wrong, and all, and because of that, nobody wants to go back and admit that they could be so wrong simply because they, they, they they're, that they were so scared that they that they ignored basic civil liberties, basic decency, you know, ba basic commitment to you know schooling to to uh, uh, and to basic basic commitment to like reading scientific data. Do you think Trump will do it differently if it happens again and he has a chance? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I don't. I. I don't think that he surrounded himself uh, with the, the best people last time, regard, especially with regard to the pandemic. Um, and I. And I don't know what process led to that. And I haven't seen enough contrition from him during the primaries for me to to have any confidence that he would not do the same thing again. Yeah. Well, this is kind of the the curse of being an interviewer is you just have to keep asking people questions until they start saying no, I don't know, I can't answer, <laughs> pass, pass. Uh, but I but I do want to ask you, you know, obviously the Supreme Court uh, is going to make a make a big decision here, one way or the other. Um, are you confident? Are you concerned? I'm very concerned, James. So the Supreme Court, uh, when I sat at the, I, <laughs> this is how naive I am, James. I, I walked in to the oral arguments. I was convinced that we were going to win 9-0. Every single judge that's looked at this case up until then, had, had, they said things like, this is an Orwellian Ministry of Truth that the Biden administration put together for the censorship complex. They, 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 they made analogies to, to uh, Al Capone going to businesses and saying, you know, that's a nice business you got there. It'd be nasty if something would happen. I mean, they were saying the government was acting like Al Capone in, with, in, in censoring, using the social media companies to censor. Um, and so I was, I was like, okay, this is this, and this is such an open and shut case to me, right? You have the government telling social media companies who and what to censor. How can that possibly be okay 
with at least my non-lawyer understanding of the First Amendment, I, I thought it was gonna be 9-0. Yet the tenor of the discussion in the Supreme Court in the oral arguments was, the government is just protecting the people from misinformation. And they need to have the ability to do that. Uh, certainly the liberal justices, uh, they seem to embrace that entirely, but even some of the conservative justices seem to embrace that. And so I, I, I and, and, the, and they seem utterly unaware of the fact that the government got everything wrong during the pandemic. I mean, even if they didn't get everything wrong during the pandemic, still the First Amendment protects the right to say incorrect things. But importantly, when the government says something incorrect, the First Amendment protects the people by allowing outside critics to correct the government. Um, and they didn't seem to have any understanding of that, except for maybe a couple of justices. Uh, so I'm not confident. Yeah, all right. Well, I mean, look, if you steel man this thing, uh, and you say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take on the character of like a, a very honest and like maximally well-meaning sort of regime person. And I'm going to say, okay, well, the truth is that we are fighting like a global digital war right now. And the reality is that we really can't share with you the details because um, the other guys aren't sharing their details. And you might get really scared and it'll make us look weak and our allies might desert us. And so we have to wage this secret war around the world. And it's not taking place like in the old days with like battleships and whatever. It's taking place in your phones and it's taking place in your mind. And so... Uh, you have to trust us because you don't have a choice. We're kind of the only government there is right now, and you can't throw us out. And, you know, you shouldn't trust Trump. You should just keep us where we are and trust that we're going to wage this secret war. And it's going to be different from the other ones. So, you know, the rights that you're accustomed to are going to have to kind of go away a little bit. After all, like Lincoln suspended habeas corpus. we got to have some flexibility here. Um, that argument isn't being made publicly, but it, I feel like it is kind of like leeching into people's feelings about what's going on. And I think there is this kind of fear spreading that it, whether it's China or whether it's Iran or whether it's the, some new axis of evil or whatever it is, um, that we do have a weak government in place and that America is sort of not really on its feet since the pandemic. Um, and that we might just kind of have to like let go of all of our cherished freedoms and let go and and see the internet as a place that isn't the same thing as America. Um, that seems to me to be the most forceful argument. Oops, sorry, we built the, this giant machine, we built all these robots, we built all the software, it, it swallowed the world, and we thought it was going to turn the world into America, but unfortunately that's not what happened. So you're kind of, you know, I, we're stuck with you, you're stuck with us, uh, we might have to white knuckle it. Uh, but the alternative is, you know, is the, the global American empire collapses, all of the adversaries pile on, and they sort of pick us, uh, pick us uh, for, for scrap, and everybody loses. What do you say to that? Okay, so a couple of things. Um, yeah. Well, that is, that's, that's quite a steel man. Let, 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 me, let, me, let, me tr let me try my best to, to address it. Okay, so, so one, um, uh, and this is just a, a, a premise of the, of the argument, is that, uh, that, that people are just... Uh, Essentially, gullible fools that are uh, that, that that are the product of the things they see, and, and that they that there's no response to it. Um, I very firmly reject that that idea of human human psychology the, of the human soul. I think that peop, some, some fundamental, deep level we understand when we're being propagandized, when we're being lied to. It doesn't always come out very quickly, but we when we're like relentlessly lied to, we understand it. And um, so if, if foreign powers are, are telling us things that are propaganda and they're not true, if they're fundamentally not true, free speech protects us against it. We have other people that can tell us this, is, this stuff is not true. Uh, and I think ultimately, uh, if this is a battle for the souls and minds of, of, of America, I think that, and not just America, but the world, that, that, that people that ultimately, I, and maybe I'm completely naive, but I, ultimately I think truth wins. And uh, the way that you uh, allow that to happen with most, the most likelihood is that you allow people to hear, hear these debates, hear these things. I don't think that everybody's rational all the time, of course not, but I do think that uh, our soul rejects propaganda, ultimately. And, it, and, the, and the ability to, 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 have a, 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 to speak to each other, to have a liberal society that encourages that, that's our biggest protection against that kind of psychological operation. Um, on a, on a sort of a more macro scale, if the American experiment is to end in authoritarian power, with the excuse that we have to destroy the American experiment in order to save it, 
Well, what's, what's the purpose served? I mean, the, 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 what makes America a unique and great and good and just and right is this commitment, this deep commitment to basic fundamental civil liberties, right? It's, the, it's part of the founding documents of the country. If we decide that we're going to get rid of that it, just temporarily in order to save it, well, I mean, why is it still worth saving? Um, I think that uh, if you if you have this idea that we the elite know what how uh, there's some c crazy thing that's happening and we're going to destroy America in order to to, to to keep America, well, I just don't trust them. I don't believe it. I don't trust them, and I, don't, I think that uh, ultimately morally, there's no there's not they're not saving an America that's worth saving if that's the case. I, I think America is worth saving, but I don't think it's the America that they're thinking is worth saving. It's not. Uh, the censorship state that's worth saving. It's, it's our fundamental liberal traditions that are worth saving. Well, I think a lot of people agree with you, and I think that even uh, at least some in the regime feel that way too. And I think a lot of people in there are actually quite uncomfortable with the direction that, that things are going in and with what they're complicit in. Uh, I think they, there's, you know, there's, there's a hope that this is just a temporary, oh, you know, we're not, we're not destroying America, we're just kind of pausing America for a while, and we'll turn it back on, we promise. One does not simply turn America back on. Well, I mean, America is a unique place. I mean, how many times in the history of, of the world has a, a, a some, you know, as, as a country come into existence with the premise that, uh, that, all, that all men are created equal? I mean, that, that, that basically happened once. Um, and it spread, the idea spread throughout the West. Uh, the idea that, uh, that, that we are all endowed with our, uh, by our creator with certain inalienable rights, I mean, if that's, if that's true, and I believe it's true, then it's not, it's not changeable, really. You can, you can suppress it for a while, you can you really harm a lot of people for a while, but you can't fundamentally change that fact. Um, I, I think Lincoln said something like this during, during, uh, dur during the, the Civil War. I mean, I think uh, that if you have uh, the establishment of, uh, of this idea that uh, the state uh, is, not, uh, is, is, is not superior to the individual. The individual is superior to the state, really. That, it, this, that, that the, the, the states serve to, to serve individuals, not the other way around. Um, well, you can't, really can't go back on that. Um, and so the idea that there's some elite out there that sees this secret war going on, uh, protecting me from information that is so dangerous I should not hear it, um, I just don't believe it. I don't believe that. I don't believe that they have that kind of wisdom, and I believe that if, if, if uh, that if they get that power, which they have, uh, they will use it for bad. Yeah. Well, you you talk about the illusion of consensus and manufacturing that illusion, and I, I think what you're telling us is that uh, <clears throat> even though that illusion can be tremendously powerful, uh, glittering, tantalizing, utopian, even uh, it's not spiritually nourishing, and we can only pretend that it is for so long. Yeah, I think so. I think I mean very well put, James. I think I think I think that. Uh, I think that we, are, if we are fed absolute nonsense, for we're, we're, we'll, we'll reject it. Uh, you know, people no longer believe really that the lockdowns were a good idea. No, they no longer really believe, not really, that masks work. If you look around, that the, uh, and and there's good reason because you know the, the the careful scientific evidence showed they didn't work. You don't need to know that careful scientific evidence to have this understanding that they were oversold that there was tremendous pressure to take a vaccine for many people probably wasn't necessary, especially if you had COVID and recovered, it wasn't necessary. You don't need to be a scientist to know that. The soul rejects false ideas. It takes time, um, but the, 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 the view of what people are like that, that has this idea that they, people are easily controlled and that there's a, 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 a sort of elite class of society that's, that's beyond being influenced by those sorts of grubby things and that they can see uh, to the center of things and therefore ought to be in control. This, it's almost like this platonic philosopher king kind of thing. Except for Plato, they, they, were, like, they were like people that were uh, trained to, do, to, do, to be good, to be just, to be compassionate, to, to, uh, to, to, to never think of themselves, right? Yeah, from birth. From birth, right. But here you have uh, this elite class that, that is, is not subject to the psychological manipulations. They, they alone can see that's the kind of thing the tyrants say. Well, it's a lot to digest, and uh, I think the American people are, are willing to do what is necessary to get through this. Um, but it's not always clear exactly what that is. What's your advice to the American people? What's the most important thing for people to be doing right now? You know, I, I still believe in America, and I still believe that our electoral system can correct uh, the, 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 uh, these kinds of abuses. I, don't, I think, I think our, our court systems can't, despite what's happened in the Supreme Court, uh, I, I think the court systems can correct 
Um, I think that every, sing every time there is, you, if you're voting for dog catcher, ask them what do they think about free speech? Uh, what, what do they think about, about these kinds of emergency powers? Make, make sure that every person in government that, that you elect knows that you are not okay with the ending of, of this kind of, of the, the, uh, of the, you're not okay with this kind of power, arbitrary power in the government. Always timely advice now more than ever. Jay, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. That's all the time we got. Give us a like, subscribe, comment below. Let me know who you want me to interview. Until then, I'm James Polis. This is Zero Hour, and may God have mercy on us all.